Uh, I'd love you to talk to each other for a few moments. Uh, we're, we're in Sunday 9 out of a 28-week sermon series through the book of Acts. Uh, one thing that shifted in you over the last eight weeks, something you've heard perhaps that you'd never heard before, maybe an encouragement that's changed some of your behavior. We're told not just to be hearers of the Word, but to be doers of the Word. So, so what's happened? How's the Word begun to do in you? Talk to each other for a few moments, please. And if there's nothing, you can be honest, okay? No judgment here. So for me, I think what is, uh, has been so astounding is just the single-minded focus on Jesus that these early followers had. Just everything about their lives revolved around Jesus, and they were able to face the most difficult circumstances and the most terrible persecutions. And rather than shy away from those things, they leaned into them, and I long to have that kind of passion for Jesus. And so perhaps uh, out of today's reading, something may shift in us. Uh, so we, we're going 28 weeks, we're asking ourselves if Jesus ascended yesterday, what should we be doing today? That really is the question that uh, ultimately planted the vision of this church about 15 years ago. And in today's reading, we get a snapshot of Saul's life. Uh, Saul, we got introduced to a few Sundays ago. Uh, he, he's one of the key Jewish theologians, a highly trained guy. One of the key Jewish leaders who was there when uh, Stephen was stoned. And what's so compelling about these Bible accounts, and one of the reasons we know the Scriptures to be true, is if I was writing my own life story, if I was doing an autobiography, I would make me look much better than I actually am. True story? Okay, I'd leave out all the bad things, and I'd elevate all the good things, and you'd read my book, and you'd be like, this book was amazing. And what I love about the Scriptures is that Paul was quite happy to have Luke write down all of the things that he was doing. He, like, he could have said, man, Luke, just like, leave the thing out about where I was standing there when Stephen was cruising, it was, was stoned. It's like, really is not cool. You know, people might think ill of me. He's like, just write it like it was, man. Like, show from where I came so that when people see Jesus at work in me, they'd be like, Oh, was he the guy? That, wow, that's incredible. And so he's quite happy for Luke to write down the undistorted truth about him. Uh, for those that don't know, Saul, Paul, same guy, different name depending where he was geographically. That's the only reason his name changed. Some people say, like, no, he was Saul, and then he got saved, and he became Paul, like Abram became Abraham. No, it was just geography. Saul, Jewish, Paul, Greek. Uh, and so I'll probably land up using his name interchangeably. He would eventually author much of the New Testament, 13 books out of the New Testament written by the Apostle Paul. And because of this, his conversion to Jesus in Acts 9 is probably one of the most significant events in the book of Acts and one of the most important events that shaped the spreading of the gospel. I'm not convinced that we'd be sitting here this morning hearing anything about Jesus if it were not for the fact that Jesus knocked Paul to his feet and blinded him. And we're going to read about that today. Let's listen to the Word of God. Acts chapter 9, tell us his reading for us. And I'm going to chew on halls so that I can keep my voice for two services. Meanwhile, Saul was still breathing out murderous threats against the Lord's disciples. He went to the high priest and asked him for letters to the synagogues in Damascus, so that if he found any there who belonged to the way, whether men or women, he might take them as prisoners to Jerusalem. As he neared Damascus on his journey, suddenly a light from heaven flashed around him. He fell to the ground and heard a voice say to him, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? Who are you, Lord? Saul asked. I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting, he replied. Now get up and go into the city, and you will be told what you must do. The men traveling with Saul stood there speechless. They heard the sound, but did not see anyone. Saul got up from the ground, but when he opened his eyes, he could see nothing. So they led him by the hand into Damascus. For three days he was blind and did not eat or drink anything. In Damascus there was a disciple named Ananias. The Lord called to him in a vision, Ananias? Yes, Lord, he answered. The Lord told him, Go to the house of Judas on Straight Street and ask for a man from Tarsus named Saul, for he is praying. In a vision he has seen a man named Ananias come and place his hands on him to restore his sight. Lord, Ananias answered, 
I have heard many reports about this man and all the harm he has done to your holy people in Jerusalem. And he has come here with authority from the chief priests to arrest all who call on your name. But the Lord said, Ananias, go. This man is my chosen instrument to proclaim my name to the Gentiles and their kings and to the people of Israel. I will show him how much he must suffer for my name. Then Ananias went to the house and entered it. Placing his hands on Saul, he said, Brother Saul, the Lord, Jesus, who appeared to you on the road as you were coming here, has sent me so that you may see again and be filled with the Holy Spirit. Immediately, something like scales fell from Saul's eyes, and he could see again. He got up and was baptized, and after taking some food, he regained his strength. Saul spent several days with the disciples in Damascus. At once he began to preach in the synagogues that Jesus is the Son of God. All those who heard him were astonished and asked, Isn't he the man who raised havoc in Jerusalem among those who call on this name? And hasn't he come here to take them as prisoners to the chief priests? Yet Saul grew more and more powerful and baffled the Jews living in Damascus by proving that Jesus is the Messiah. After many days had gone by, there was a conspiracy among the Jews to kill him. But Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. But his followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through, the, through an opening in the wall. When he came to Jerusalem, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord, and that the Lord had spoken to him, and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. So Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. When the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Then the church throughout Judea, Galilee, Samaria, enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in the fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in numbers. As Peter traveled about the country, he went to the, visit the Lord's people who lived in Lydda. There he found a man named Ananias, Ananias, who was paralyzed and had been bedridden for eight years. Ananias, Peter said to him, Jesus Christ heals you. Get up and roll up your mat. And immediately Ananias got up. All those who lived in Lydda and Sharon saw him and turned to the Lord. In Joppa, there was a disciple named Tabitha. In Greek, her name is Dorcas. She was always doing good and helping the poor. About that time, she became sick and died and her body was washed and placed in an upstairs room. Lydda was near Joppa, so when the disciples heard that Peter was in Lydda, they sent two men to him and urged him, Please come at once. Peter went with them, and when he arrived, he was taken upstairs to the room. All the widows stood around him, crying and showing him the robes and other clothing that Dorcas had made while she was still with them. Peter sent them all out of the room. Then he got down on his knees and prayed. Turning towards the dead woman, he said, Tabitha, get up. She opened her eyes, and seeing Peter, she sat up. He took her by the hand and helped her to her feet. Then he called for the believers, especially the widows, and presented her to them alive. This became known all over Joppa, and many people believed in the Lord. Peter stayed in Joppa for some time with a tanner named Simon. Thanks so much. So Saul's traveling from place to place, persecuting the church, and, and what I love about Jesus' love for the church is he loves us with such a passion that if you hurt us, you're hurting him. Like, who, who are you? I'm the one that you're persecuting, Jesus says to Saul. And Jesus loves his church, and so in saving Saul, he does two things. One, he undoes some of the persecution, and so the church began to have a season at least of somewhat peace. Uh, so central was Paul to this driving agenda of the Jewish people to persecute the Christian church. That's one part of what Jesus does by saving Paul. But the other thing that he does is he uses Paul to reach the Greek-speaking world. So Paul was this trained theologian. He trained under a guy called Gamaliel, who was one of the most respected theologians of his time, uh, and, and the Greeks 
We're a very intellectual people. You can read through Paul's writings. If you read, for example, one of the most challenging books to read is Paul's letter to the church in Rome. It's just this absolute tome of a work. Beautiful theology. And what Paul is is doing is taking all of his Jewish training, all of this massive intellect, and then translating it for the Greek-speaking world. And so not only does God save Paul so that the persecution stops, but he saves Paul so that these blooming Greeks who are so caught up in their mind and all this academia will come to know the wonder of who Jesus is. And so the reason reason we're here today is because that's exactly what Paul did. Now, Paul had no intent to follow Jesus. In fact, if you could have gotten Paul incensed, it would be late in the evening after having been persecuting the church all day, you made some suggestion that it seemed a little bit like you were batting for that side. Paul would have lost his mind. There was nothing in him that even wanted Jesus to be true. But when Jesus elects someone and lays his hand upon that person, there is no undoing the power of the Holy Spirit. So, so we respond to God, but we, we only respond to God because God has already been doing some work in us, softening our hearts, drawing us closer through the input of friends into our lives. He's beginning to, to plow open the ground, ready to receive the word. And then when we respond, it looks like it's all us. I mean, I remember coming to faith uh, during grade 11, during my confirmation year. And and at the moment, I recall making a decision for Jesus. But in hindsight, as I've gotten older, I've realized more and more that it was God who was at work way before I responded to him. And here's how Paul would later write about this to the church that he planted in Ephesus. He says this, For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption into sonship through Christ Jesus. Coming to faith starts with God choosing us. And I imagine that after the event, Paul sat down perhaps a few weeks later, maybe months later, looked back upon that season and thought to himself, like, how did I get from where I was to where I am now? It could only have been God at work. Long before I responded, long before I ever mentioned the name of Christ, while I was still murdering Stephen there, giving approval over his death, God already must have been at work in Paul's heart. Coming to faith always starts with God's work in us, and God does some powerful stuff in Paul's life, and knocks him to the ground, blinds him, uh, and then speaks audibly to him, so much so that the people around him could hear. Jesus is making it almost impossible for Paul to come to faith, and my hope is that God would make it impossible for you, who are still outside of the kingdom, to not come to faith. Uh, I would hope that Jesus would present himself to you Sunday after Sunday here. I hope that in the way that you live your life, God would constantly be pressed in to a point where it becomes impossible for you to ignore Jesus any longer. And for every one of us in this building that has some Jesus story, you realize that was in fact the case. I came from a family that uh, were not particularly religious. Um, My dad once said, uh, Christianity is a crutch for people that can't get to heaven on their own. Um, Then um, when I went into ministry, he was like mortified that I was throwing away my engineering degree. I remember my dad dropping me at Sunday school and then going home to wash the car and coming back to fetch me afterwards. Um, Maybe some of you have similar stories. Um, And yet out of that place, God called me. And when God begins to call You cannot ignore his voice, and Paul is left with no option but to respond to Jesus. And conversion to faith in Christ is the most powerful thing that can happen to any person. It should trump us getting married or having kids as important as those things are. Because you ask people, like, what's the most important day in your life? Oh, the day I got married. I remember what, no, the day I got saved. That, that should be primary. Or the day your kids were born. Oh, it was amazing. I remember. I, no, no, Jesus should be more important than those things. Jesus, I read this last week. If you love your mother or father more than me, you are not worthy of me. In fact, I would argue that the only way to love our spouse and our kids as much as we should is to love Jesus more than we love them. Otherwise, we will turn them into idols. And it's a, it's a profound miracle when God takes someone as far from Jesus as Paul was and draws them in. Now, I love this because I know some pretty dodgy people, okay? I don't know, you've got some dodgy friends, like really far from Jesus? You know anybody that goes around murdering Christians? No, okay. So if Jesus can save Paul, he can save your friend. I don't care how set in his ways your friend is, how against God his language is, how deeply seated those, those atheistic ideas are embedded in his mind, in his thinking, and in his way of life. If Jesus can save Paul, he can save your friends. This is the beauty of the gospel being God's work on our behalf that Jesus can save anyone he chooses.
No one is outside of salvation. But not everyone has been well taught about what it actually means to be saved or to receive Jesus. I've reflected on this a lot over the years because in some churches, conversion never happens. We never talk about being saved in some churches. What makes you Christian is simply being born into a Christian family. You're Christian by being born and you go to heaven by dying. That just seems to be how it works. It, it, like, I, I never understand this. Like, no profession of faith is needed. No repentance of sin is needed. Uh, no change in lifestyle. You, you, you simply get born into a Christian family. That makes you Christian. And all you have to do to get to heaven, in my understanding, this is how a lot of people seem to live, is that you have to die. And I'm not sure that is at all what the Scriptures teach. So Paul never makes any claim of any sort of family tree, never, never claims some sort of heritage of faith. In fact, in one of his letters to the church in Philippi, he says this, If any one of you thinks they have reason to put confidence in the flesh, I have more, okay? I was circumcised on the eighth day. I come from the people of Israel. I was born of the tribe of Benjamin, I, a Hebrew of Hebrews, but whatever gains to me, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, he says, I consider everything in my life a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ as my Lord, for whose sake I've lost all things. I consider them garbage, and he uses a much more politically incorrect term there. Uh, it means it, excrement would be the best way. It's the stuff that you would find in the bottom of the long drop when you go camping. That's what he considers his life in, in, in relation to the beauty of who Jesus is. And he says, As I consider them garbage that I might gain Christ and be found in him. He makes, he makes no claim that he is any family tree that's going to save him. Then the other thing I often hear in churches is that somehow we've tied baptism and being saved too closely together. I think they're, I think they're interrelated. They're important. But we are not saved by baptism, okay? In fact, in the particular passage we've just read, it's almost in passing, and he was baptized. That's all it says. And baptism for Paul came much later after he met Jesus. But the belief in many churches is that you're saved by having someone sprinkle water on you when you were a baby. And I was at a funeral once, and there was a young man had died. It was a tragic death. I knew the family and I remember the minister standing up, and despite all of the train wreck of this guy's life, and his life was a train wreck. He was a longtime alcohol and drug abuser, had been walking away from Christ for years and years and years. And the minister said, we can celebrate that he is in heaven today because he was baptized. And I almost fell out of my chair. Whilst Paul was baptized, he wrote extensively about baptism. It is really clear to know that whilst baptism is important, it's not necessary. And I can prove this to you very simply. Do you remember the man on the cross next to Jesus? Bad guy, good guy. The, the, the gooder bad guy recognizes his badness, calls out on Jesus, and Jesus says to him, today you'll be with me in paradise. He never tithes, never goes to a worship service never reads scripture, never gets baptized, and yet today you will be with me. It's important, baptism. If you, if you are a follower of Jesus and you have not yet been baptized, would you come speak to me after the service? Let's arrange a date and let's baptize you. It's a profoundly important thing. I'm not convinced that you can be a follower of Jesus and not have been baptized and consider yourself an obedient follower of Jesus, okay? We're all disobedient to some level. It's one of the things you've got to get right. As much as if you're you know, stealing from the tax man, I think you should stop stealing from the tax man. Can you steal from the tax man and still be a Christian? You can. You shouldn't, but you can. And if you are, you should get it sorted out. Like, don't keep walking down that road. I'll come more to that in a few minutes. So Paul makes, Paul makes no claim to lineage. Never says, like, oh, but my family have always been part of the church. You know, oh, we just grew up in a Christian home. He never makes any claim to that, and he could have, but he, he does not. And he never makes any claim that my baptism is what saved me. He does Get baptized because he realizes that it is an identification with Jesus. It's an, it's an acknowledgement he would later write of being buried with Christ in baptism and then raised to new life with him. Okay. But in other churches, the, th the one thing that we get told to do, and I think this will be much more your experience than, I, I'm not sure there's that many of you that may claim some sort of lineage. Maybe there are, and if that's you, let's shift that. And I'm not sure how many of you are going to go like, oh, I'm going to go to heaven because I was baptized. But if it is you... I want you to not put your faith in your baptism at all. 
But I suspect that a lot of us did this little thing. Who here ever prayed a sinner's prayer at some point on a camp or perhaps at a youth group? Okay, no shame in this, okay? Like, don't, don't give me, I, I prayed it. I prayed, prayed it multiple times. You know, because how it goes, like you pray the sinner's prayer and you get saved and then you like stuff your life up and then you have to pray it again and pray it again. Okay, so for those that don't know, by the way, what a sinner's prayer is, here's what comes up on Wikipedia. Like it actually has a sinner's prayer on Wikipedia. Dear Lord Jesus, I know that I'm a sinner. I ask for your forgiveness. I believe you died for my sins and rose from the dead, and so I turn from my sins and invite you to, become, to invite you to come into my heart and life. I want to trust you and follow you as my Lord and Savior. Now, I don't think sinners' prayers are bad, okay? Uh, I'm, I, I think they have their place, perhaps, at some point in churches. What is interesting for me, though, is that not in any place in all of the Scriptures is any form of a sinner's prayer ever given, and at no point does any... I can hear someone, something beeping. <laughs> Uncle Liz. Never done that before. Come on. <laughs> Plug it in. Close the lid. <laughs> I'm going to make him pray a sinner's prayer after this. Just checking that it's quiet before I carry on. Good. Okay. So... So the sinner's prayer basically is this prayer that we pray nowhere in Scripture. Like, my, my thought is this, that if the sinner's prayer is that important, surely at some point, somewhere in the New Testament, somebody would have used a sinner's prayer to draw someone into the kingdom. But you don't find one. And, and I would think that if it was that important, much like the Lord's Prayer, Jesus would have said, here's the format, okay? You've got to pray this prayer in this way. And I remember when I learned how to pray a sinner's prayer, it was like acknowledge that I'm a sinner, believe that Jesus raised me from the dead, confess my sins, and then just go and do it. That's why I got taught it, like A, B, C, D, like so you can remember these things. Nothing. Nowhere in all of the scriptures. Paul does not pray a sinner's prayer. In fact, what is quite interesting about Paul's salvation, and and look here, let's be honest, the Bible doesn't record every conversation that happened over those days, but nowhere does he even openly confess his sin. That's interesting for me. So it seems to me that what has been taught for many years in kids' churches and Sunday schools around the world is something that's definitely not biblical. I'm not sure that it's entirely unhelpful, but, but I, I wonder sometimes how much we put faith in the fact that we prayed the sinner's prayer more so than we put our faith in Jesus. Like in the same way that some people would go, oh, but I'm going to go to heaven because I was baptized, or I'm going to go to heaven because I come from a Christian family. I wonder how many of us are going, oh, I'm going to go to heaven because I prayed a sinner's prayer. And none of those three things can save you. There's no magic family. There's no magic bloodline. There's, there's no magic ritual, and there are no magic words. Scripture is really clear on that. And so I, I'm concerned that there are some who have their faith either in lineage or in baptism or even in the sinner's prayer. We are saved by Jesus. And yes, we, we may pray to him. That's part of the process. And yes, in response to what he does, we may get baptized that's part of the process. And then when we do those things, we get added to his family. That's the family that you get saved by, by the way, being part of the family of God. But it's always about Jesus. So the most common word tied to all of these things, this whole process of being saved, we read it way back in Acts chapter 2. It talks about repenting and then being baptized. Bekirung in Afrikaans. I think is that, that's the right word, to bekir. Uh, I love Afrikaans. It's such a crazy language. Uh, the, the, the words are the best. There's no, no better language in the world to they get cross in than in Afrikaans. I mean, it just has some of the best crosswords, you know. Bekirung. It's a direction of the inside person turning away from one thing and turning towards something else. The Greek word that Paul would have written down was metanoia, a literal changing of one's mind. You know that, you know when you believe one thing absolutely and then you suddenly find out you're watching Discovery Channel, oh my goodness, I've been believing the wrong thing all my life. Like when I was a kid, I was told you're not allowed to swim. Uh, at least it's got to wait an hour after having had a meal because otherwise you'll get cramps and you'll drown. Who else swam within an hour of eating a meal? We're all around. Does anybody know anybody that drowned because of eating a meal? No. It was an old wife's tale. At some point, change your mind is really what it's about. Repentance. 
It's much more powerful than a family line. It's much more powerful than being baptized. It's much more powerful than some sort of ritualized prayer that the church has adopted. So let me tell you a story that may help. Uh, it was, for me, is one of the most sharp things in my life that reminds me of what it means to, be, to, to repent. So I did a hike uh, recently up Tafelberg in the Cedarberg. Some of you may have been up there. And I, it reminded me of the first time I went to Tafelberg. It was in 1995, I think, as close as I can recall. It was 1995. We had no... No map. We had some vague directions. You drive up the road, you turn left, you park under the trees. The trees are still there to this day, like a a little grove of oak trees. And then you follow the path across the river and up the hill to the mountain where there's a cave and you sleep in the cave. Like it didn't seem that hard. Okay, so we left lunchtime on a Friday. We arrive in the Cedarburg about three o'clock. It is like the Cedarburg always is in midsummer. It was cooking hot. It was ridiculous. There was no wind. I remember it to this day as clear as anything. We get out of the car. We see the path. We walk down, we jump across the river, we head across the flutters, and then we begin to head up the mountainside. And the path begins to zigzag as it goes up the mountainside. And at one point, we're walking in this direction, and the path zigged back this direction, but it was in some rocks at that particular point, and the path wasn't so obvious. And it was clear that we weren't the only stupid people, because others also had gone straight and begun to make a path through this thick fainbos. And so we went straight. And we went on for I don't know how long, but it was long. It was like 45 minutes, maybe an hour, and it was so hot. It was mid-30s. I was pouring sweat, and I eventually totally lost my cool, and I was like, I'm done. I'm going home now, okay? And the problem is, is that you can't just snap your fingers and arrive back at your car. You have to go back the way that you came. And so we did. We bushwhacked our way through all this prickly undergrowth for the next 40 minutes all the way back. And then we arrive at the hairpin bend, and there's the path, as clear as day. So we head up the path. We spend two nights up at the, up at the mountainside, carrying these, lugging these packs up the side of the mountain. And for me, that story is about as clear as I can get it about what it means to repent of one sin. It's to recognize at some point that you're heading off in a direction that is just untenable. You can't keep going this way. It seems downhill, but the bushes are thick, and they're cutting at your skin, and the sweat is pouring, and at some point you realize, I do not want this anymore. And it's not easy to turn back from that kind of direction. And let me tell you, the older you are, the harder it is. Like when you're 16 and coming to faith, your parents just think something weird happened to you, whatever. You know, it's just a phase that they're going through. When you've been doing the same thing for 40 years of your life, and you meet Jesus, turning around can be incredibly difficult. And I have no idea how difficult it was for Paul to turn around that day. Set in his ways, weeks, months, chasing, pursuing, imprisoning, murdering Christians. And bushwhacking back is as hard sometimes as going that way. Turning away from this path that you've been on for a long time is almost as difficult as it was going down that path. Can only imagine the awkward conversations that Paul may have had to have trying to explain that he no longer believed that killing Christians was permissible. And the tender conversations having to sit down with family members of those that he'd persecuted, imprisoned, and possibly even murdered. And in his later letters to the other churches, he acknowledges how wrong he had been, how misplaced his passion was, and how foolish his earlier beliefs were. He writes at one point, Christ Jesus came to save sinners of whom I am the worst. There is no shame in Paul. Like he recognizes that he cannot keep going the path that he is going. And he turns around. And if you turn around, you may need to eat some humble pie. And your family will say things to you like, but didn't you always say that? And didn't you always do that? And you're going to have to say, I used to, but not anymore. And when Paul claims to have turned away from his old life and now turned towards Jesus, the other followers, rightfully so, are a little skeptical. And Ananias is told by God, like, he's my chosen instrument to take the good news to the Gentiles. Because he's like, but I know this oak. Like, I've lost four or five friends, perhaps. I, we've heard the stories. I'm not going near him. I'm not touching him with a barge pole, you know, once bitten, twice shy. No, go. He is my guy. 
And then even after Paul comes to faith fully, he then wants to be part of the fellowship of believers. And when he came to Jerusalem, verse 26, he tried to join the disciples, but they were all afraid of him, not believing that he really was a disciple. They're kind of skeptical, and rightfully so. You'd be foolish if you weren't. You don't just open the doors of membership into the church to anyone who simply says, I'm a follower of Jesus. So what does Barnabas do? Because he's killing people, now he claims to be Christian. How, How do we legitimize his claims? And I I thought about making a whole long tangent on this one, right? But there's a whole portion of the world that are simply believing some stuff in their hearts and asking us to agree with their crazy claims about their self-identity. No, show me some evidence. And Barnabas stands up for Paul. He makes no claim about Paul praying a sinner's prayer, makes no claim about Paul's lineage, makes no claim about Paul's baptism, He mentions none of the things that churches often look for. Because this is how it happens, right? I've mentioned this before. So we're technically a Presbyterian church, and the way it works is if you worship at another Presbyterian church and you want to come into membership here, so you're down at Belleville and you decide you want to come be a member here, what happens is Belleville writes you a transfer certificate. Literally, there is a book of certificates, and the minister fills it in. What date were you baptized? What date did you come into membership? And then the minister signs it, and he sends it on. And then the idea is I look at that and go, it's very good. They were baptized on that date, and they were meant to membership on that date. Therefore, they are Christian. True, not true. There's no guarantee because your name's on a piece of paper, right? It's like I know a lot of people that are members of golf clubs. 18th hole never happens. The 19th hole happens lots. It's just a drinking club for people with golf problems. Something, something like that somebody once said. He makes no mention of any of the things that churches often use to claim that someone has been saved. But Barnabas took him and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey, journey had seen Jesus. Like, how often do we ask that question? Hey, tell us you want to join us. Awesome. Tell me when you met Jesus. That's what Barnabas goes to. And then he says this. uh, He'd seen the Lord. The Lord had spoken to him and how in Damascus he had preached fearlessly in the name of Christ. Barnabas is really saying this. Paul was walking in one direction, believing Jesus was a myth. And now he's preaching about Jesus to anyone who will listen. Was walking that way. He's walking that way. And if you want to go check it out, just have a look at his life. Repentance in the Bible is a clear change in the direction of someone's heart, and it's always accompanied by some form of evidence. I used to believe that, but now I believe this, and I behave differently because of it. My eyes were fixed on that path, like me bumbling my way through the undergrowth in the Cedarburg, and at some point I turned my head around and I looked back towards another path. And I was walking in that direction. And it's not just that I've stopped walking in that direction. I have turned around and I'm walking away from it. I once held to a whole bunch of these truths and I now proclaim the truth. And churches, Sunday after Sunday, are filled with people who will never taste glory, who will never meet Jesus other than Jesus the righteous judge, and yet they believe that they're saved because they prayed a sinner's prayer once on grade eight camp. And there are people all over the world, millions of them, millions of them who believe that because they were baptized as babies that they will go to heaven despite the fact that there is nothing in their lives that presents any evidence at all that they are walking with Jesus. They are wandering in the wilderness and continuing on that path that Jesus spoke about, the broad path that leads to destruction. And if you've stopped on the side of your path bumbling through that undergrowth and found a little tree under which you find shelter, you have still not repented Repentance is a turning away from something and walking towards Christ. And listen, you're never going to get it perfectly. I was up at Tafelberg the last trip. We got off path again, much shorter this time, because we saw a little cairn at night. We were hiking up a headlamp, and there I saw a little pile of pebbles on a rock. Ah, there's the path. We're not on the path. That's going to happen. But when you are following Jesus, when you are listening to his voice, you will recognize very quickly that you're off that path. And he will present you with a choice, follow me or keep walking to destruction. And those who love Christ will hear the shepherd's voice and they will follow him in the darkness back to the path that leads to eternal life. And it is a narrow path and few find it. It's only when you've allowed Jesus to turn your life around that you're saved. And there will always be evidence for it. And sure, your evidence might not be like Paul traveling to Athens and proclaiming in the Areopagus the goodness of God, this unknown God that you worship. Let me tell you about the real God. 
That, that, that might not be your calling. Your calling might not be to have Paul's intellect and to be debating deep theological debates with your atheistic friends. But I would contend with you that you need to look at your life because there are far too many people who claim to be followers of Jesus and there is no evidence in their lives that that is true at all. The man on the cross cursing Christ and then suddenly saying to his friend, we deserve this. He's done nothing wrong. Like Jesus changes people's lives. Even in his short Christian walk, which lasted only as long as he was on that cross, you can see the orientation of his heart changes. Again, I think we get this wrong because often when we talk about repentance, I'll say to you, tell us, you know, that thing you were doing, you've got to stop doing that bad thing. You've got to repent of that sin. And I don't think that's a bad thing. But the problem is not the bad behavior. It's a heart that is oriented towards Jesus that needs to happen. And your heart is oriented towards darkness. And you have got to resolve that. I think we often make it about the behavior, but behavior always shows what's going on in the heart. Behavior is evidence of belief. And when somebody says, I believe in Jesus, there is behavior that evidences that. Very careful distinction. Bear with me for a moment. We are not saved by our good behavior. Do you understand this? I don't care how many good things you do. Paul, at, at this point, is doing everything a good Jewish guy should do. He is following the law to the letter, killing those who are blaspheming the name of God. It's not enough. I don't care how often you come to worship. I don't care how often you read your Bible. I don't care how often you pray the, 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 the sinner's prayer, okay, or the Lord's prayer, or any other prayer, including St. Patrick's prayer. Very beautiful. Thank you, Paul. Um, those religious rituals cannot save you. And your sinner's prayer when you were 16 years old on grade nine camp, which normally happened on Sunday night because like everybody's tired, you haven't slept in two days and then there's like come to Jesus music. Like don't trust your sinner's prayer. Don't trust your baptism. Don't trust your family. Don't trust your religious behavior. Trust Jesus and steer your heart towards him. Repentance produces a changed life. And Paul's story becomes so compelling because there is this massive transformation. And when the church asks Barnabas, he answers, let me tell you what he's been doing. It must be Jesus because nothing else could turn a murderer into someone ready to be murdered other than Jesus. Let me close. I hope you love Jesus. I hope you hear Jesus. And if you don't hear him audibly, which very, very few people ever do, I pray that you would hear Jesus speak through every person that stands in this pulpit. I pray that our kids would hear Jesus speak through the mouths of a Sunday school teacher who doesn't know what they're doing and feels insecure and irrelevant and trying to like get from one generation to the next seems almost impossible. And yet I pray that our kids would hear the voice of Jesus calling them to come home through those stuttered, stumbled words that that kid's church teacher is doing as best as they possibly can. My prayer is that you would hear Jesus, for there is salvation found nowhere else, and there is no other name given under heaven by which we might be saved. And if you want to gain eternity and see God's kingdom, there is only one way to do it, and that is to turn your heart towards Jesus like Paul did. Everything else, your confession of sin, your baptism, your sinner's prayer, every, all of that is great. It can, it can be beautiful things. Lovely watching families who have generational faith pass it on to the next generation. But at some point, if your heart has not been steered towards Jesus, you're still stuck on that path that leads to destruction. And Jesus is everything, and he becomes so real to Paul that his life is forever reoriented. Yeah, sure, he has to bash his way back, eat a bit of humble pie. But he owns his mistakes, and he acknowledges his sin and his shame. But he does it because Jesus is the way to be saved from this world. And ultimately, Jesus saves him for this world. And I'm immensely grateful for what Jesus did on that road outside Damascus so long ago because I get to stand here and tell you about the goodness of Jesus. That's pretty awesome. And you get to respond. So let's do that. Jesus, I know that every single Sunday there are people in other churches and in this church, Lord, we're not immune to this. There are people who have been ill-taught. And so there are some this morning who are trusting their baptism much more than they're trusting you. And there are some this morning, Jesus, who are trusting the fact that they've just always been part of the church. 
and others are trusting the fact that they prayed a prayer once. And each of those things individually can be beautiful things that help bolster our faith, that help reaffirm our faith. But Jesus, they are not the substance of our faith. Our faith is you. And you showed yourself to Paul. And I pray that you would show yourself to each and every one of us. For some of us, Lord, we made decisions to follow you as we responded to your call on our lives. We made those decisions a long time ago. And I just want to thank you that you've held on to us. The fact, the fact that we're here now in this building listening to the gospel taught and proclaimed is because you have held on to us. And thank you, Jesus, that you promise you will never let us go. Nothing can separate us from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. But I know that there are some this morning who need to respond. And I'm not going to lead you in a sinner's prayer this morning, but I am going to give you some silence. And maybe you need to do what Paul did and just say, who are you, Lord? And I'm here to tell you that Jesus Christ is the Lord. Spend some time in prayer, perhaps thanksgiving, perhaps responding to Jesus. Jesus, uh, we sung last week a beautiful hymn, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine. And I pray for all of us who know you and who are legitimately saved by you, that you would give us a deep assurance in our hearts that we are yours and that you are ours. A reminder that you will never let us go and you will never leave us and never forsake us. But as much, Lord Jesus, I pray for those who are perhaps trusting other things who have found their assurance of salvation in things outside of you, I pray that you would dash those hopes, that you would call them to come and follow you, for you, Jesus, are the hope of the world. So we commit ourselves into your hands, ask that you would be at work in us, and then ultimately, like Paul, as you save us, Jesus, would you be at work through us? There are friends and family that we know and love who do not yet know the love that you have for them and we would long to see them saved. Use us. Help us to tell our Jesus story. Help us to convince them and encourage them and debate with them so that they might know the great love with which they have been loved at the cross of Christ. We ask your blessing and we ask this in Jesus' name. God's people agreed and said, Amen. 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 Friends, I hope that was a blessing to you. Again, we'd love you to plug in and connect to us and to be the church rather than just watching church. And so head to our website, www.proteavalleychurch.org, and you will find all of the relevant information there. We'd love to help plug you into a midweek community. We'd love to help you come and gather with us on Sunday mornings. We'd love to help find a space for you to serve. One of the ways that you can start serving right now is to scan the code now for SnapScan. We'd love you to partner with us. Ministry costs money. We fund a whole bunch of international missionaries around the world who are taking the good news to the nations. We have absolutely loads of phenomenal life transforming local ministries in various places in our neighborhoods, in local townships, uh, through other organizations who we partner with. And we would love you to partner with us and that out of your money, we would see fruit, a harvest for Jesus kingdom. So please do scan that code and partner with us as we seek to see Jesus made famous amongst the nations here and right to the very ends of the earth. I pray that you have a great week worshiping Jesus and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God who is our heavenly father and the friendship and fellowship of Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. Go in peace and serve Jesus this week well. Amen.